Export subsidies. Export subsidies are payments by the government for each unit exported. Generally, the objective is to stimulate exports. When there are export subsidies, then the exporter has an incentive to focus on the export market. But the issue here is that you have an exporter exporting to other countries, let's say the importer. If there are subsidies in this country and products are being sold at a relatively low price, then what the importing country can do is impose tariffs or what are called countervailing duties. So effectively, the price will go up over here in the importing country. If a small country imposes export subsidies, then domestic prices will rise. This is because domestic producers will focus more on the export market. The amount produced for the local market will go down and hence prices will go up. If a large country imposes export subsidies, then by definition world prices decline as quantity increases. When this happens, the benefit of the subsidy is actually being partially transferred to the importing country. The net welfare is down both in the cases of a large country as well as a small country. The net welfare decreases further or decreases actually more in the case of a large country because some of the benefit is being transferred to the trading partner or the importing country. Over here, I have reproduced an exhibit from the curriculum, panel A and panel B. These panels summarize what we have talked about and I think you should go over this material because you are likely or because this material is quite testable. I'll just help you read this. We are given the different sorts of restrictions. Let's look at the first one, a tariff. What is the impact on the importing country? And note that with a tariff, we talked about the impact on the importing country. We talked about the fact that the producer surplus increases, consumer surplus goes down, government revenue increases by the amount of the tariff multiplied by the quantity that is imported. There is a decrease in national welfare for a small country. With a large country, there is a possible increase in the welfare. Now, again, note, this is not always the case. This might happen. With an import quota, again, the impact is on the importing country. The content here is essentially similar to what we see with the tariff. The difference is related to the government revenue. The impact on government revenue is mixed. It depends on whether the quota rents are captured by the importing country through sale of licenses or by the exports. And again, with national welfare, there is a decrease in small country welfare. With a large country, there could be an increase. Export subsidy impacts the exporting country. The producer surplus increases, consumer surplus decreases, government revenue falls because a subsidy by definition is a negative tax. So the government spending rises and national welfare decreases. With the voluntary export restraint, the impact is on the importing country. The producer surplus increases, consumer surplus decreases. There is no impact on government revenue. Remember, the benefit is being captured by the exporter and the national welfare goes down. This slide shows the impact on price, domestic consumption, domestic production and trade. Again, we have gone through all this material. Make sure you can remember this content.
Now let's do a small example and again I think this is quite testable. Thailand, a small country, has to decide whether to impose a tariff or a quota on the import of computers. You are considering investing in a local firm that is a major importer of computers. The good thing about this example is that it connects what you are learning in economics with your role as a financial analyst or your role as an investor. I want you to answer these questions before you look at the solution. If you've understood what we've talked about so far, this will be very straightforward. What is the impact on prices in Thailand? When there is a tariff, obviously prices will go up. Quantity produced will go up because now the domestic price is higher. So domestic producers will produce more. Quantity imported in Thailand is going to come down. If Thailand imposes a tariff, what will the impact be on prices in the exporting country? Remember, Thailand is a small country that has been specified here, which means that it is a price taker. Thailand's actions do not impact the price of computers outside Thailand, especially in the exporting country here. So there is no impact. How would a tariff affect consumer surplus, producer surplus and government revenue? The consumer surplus comes down, the producer surplus goes up and the government revenue goes up. There are three more questions. Explain whether the net effect of a tariff is the same as that of a quota. And we've been through this. With a tariff, clearly the revenue goes to the government. With a quota, the effect is mixed. There is this quota rent, which could be captured by the exporter or it could be captured by the government depending on the government's actions. Which policy, a tariff or a quota, would be most beneficial to the local importer in which you may invest and why? This is a good question. If you think of a local importer and a tariff, the tariff is not good for the importer because that extra tariff is simply going to the government. And with a tariff, the quantity comes down. So overall, this will hurt the local importer. On the other hand, if there is a quota, then whether or not the importer benefits depends on whether the importer can capture any of that quota rent. If the importer can capture some of this quota rent, then the importer will be better off with a quota. If Thailand were to negotiate a voluntary export restraint with the countries from which it imports computers, would this be better or worse than an import quota for the local importing firm in which you may invest? The answer here is that the local firm will not benefit. All the benefit goes to the exporting firm. So generally, this is not a smart thing to do for the importing country. Trading blocks, common markets and economic unions. Trading blocks are also called regional trading agreements or RTAs. And let's look at the different kinds of agreements. The most basic is called a free trade area or a free trade agreement. What happens here is that there are no trade restrictions between members, but each member or each country will have its own policy with non-members. A classic example of a free trade agreement is NAFTA, which is the agreement between Canada, the United States and Mexico. Goods and services can flow between these countries but each country has its own policies with other countries. As an example, the United States will have its own policy with China, Mexico will have its own policy with China, and so on. The next level of integration is a customs union. In addition 
to this all member countries adopt a common set of trade restrictions with non members so if canada us and mexico were to say that they have one customs zone and they have the same agreements with other countries then we would have a customs union the next level of integration is a common market here in addition to what we talked about with a customs union all barriers to the movement of labor and capital goods among member countries are removed in other words labor and capital now can move freely between all the members of a common market an economic union is the next level of integration here member countries establish common institutions and economic policy and the final level of integration is a monetary union where all countries adopt a single currency and the classic example would be the eurozone this might sound simple but on an exam it might be hard to recall the exact definition of each of these so i'm just going to make a suggestion for how to remember this if you can think of a better way then you can let me know or you can post your method on a discussion group hopefully it is easy to remember the extremes the first and most basic form of uh, agreement is to have a free trade area or a free trade agreement and the classic example there being nafta at the other end we have a monetary union and the classic example there is the eurozone so those are easy to remember then you just have three other sorts of agreements to remember customs union simply means that these three countries now have a common set of rule a customs union simply means that we are removing this constraint in other words there is one customs policy so we say we have a customs union the next level and i know this might sound a little silly but think of this as cm come on mexico what this is saying is all people from mexico are free to come and work in the united states now i know that that is not likely to happen anytime soon but just to help you remember the next level after a customs union let's say nafta is going deeper and deeper towards a union then the next level would be where people from mexico are allowed to come work in the united states so cm come on mexico you can think of it that way again not likely to happen any time in the near future and then the next level is where the three countries of north america they come up with a common set of institutions that make economic policy so from cm we go on to economic union and finally we have a monetary union not sure if that helps or not but make sure you remember what each of these means the final point on this slide is that rtas or regional trade agreements generally tend to be more popular than large multilateral trading agreements and the reason is that it is easier for countries that are near each other to trade and interact with each other the final part of section 3 has to do with capital restrictions some governments restrict the inward and or outward flow of capital and that is what we mean when we say capital restrictions restrictions on inflows might be due to strategic or defense related reasons so a given country might say that they do not want foreigners investing in a particular industry that is either strategic or defense related another reason given for capital restrictions is that at times it might cause volatility in the financial markets of a country and the rationale is as follows if foreigners invest in the financial markets of a given country and there is an economic crisis in the region or in the country 
then foreigners are likely to quickly pull out their money. And the argument goes that if this country easily allows foreigners to put in money and pull out money, then the capital markets in the country will tend to go up and down very easily. The volatility will be high, which will be detrimental to this particular economy. Now, this is the reason given. Economists might not agree with this. In fact, there are some studies that suggest that when economies open up and allow capital to flow in and out very easily, then in the long run, the impact on volatility is not that much. In fact, some studies indicate that the riskiness of markets actually goes down. But nevertheless, recognize the fact that there are some instances of this happening, so it is presented as a reason. Why do countries not like money leaving their country? This happens with countries like Pakistan, for example, with scarce foreign exchange and countries will then like to restrict any outflows. If a country already has limited foreign exchange, then it would not make sense for residents of the country to be allowed to take money out of the country. And related to that is the fact that small countries with limited amounts of foreign exchange would like the people of their country to invest in the country so as to boost local industry. As I alluded to earlier, overall, in the long term, capital restrictions tend to reduce welfare. I don't think we need to get too detailed into this area, but as long as you recognize these main points, you are in good shape. If you do want some more detail, I would suggest you read example 9 in the curriculum.